We don't just want to demonstrate something about edibility. We want people to notice that they're walking around bonking into the into the walls of their containment all the time, asking uh. themselves, oh, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of mm. all of this? Mm. And what we're doing here is just letting the earth burst forth with self-evident meaning and wonder so that people can just stand here and be appreciative and stop asking such silly questions, you know? I mean, native cultures don't ask that question because they are they're living the meaning, you know, of what it means to be in deep connection. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson and I'm in Portland, Oregon. And in front of me, along with Principal Mark Lakeman at Communitecture, right? That's right. An architecture and planning and design business here in the city. Mark is also the founder or co-founder of City Repair in Oregon in Portland that is making transformations all through the city. Thank you for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. It's a total well, pleasure. I want it. We are at your your urban edible food forest around your around your business. Yeah, it's a demonstration project for uh, all kinds of different ideas, including including urban agriculture. But more than that, we also are wanting to encourage biodiversity in the city, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. create um, a sort of a you know an environment for for habitat for birds and small yeah. mammals and certainly maybe as much as anyone insects mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time we're very interested in the work that we do in breaking down this notion that um, humans and nature must be kept separate. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that people feel that somehow we have to protect nature from ourselves because I, I largely feel that way too but at the same time I want to recognize that you know, the ground that we're sitting on right now was occupied for thousands of years by native people who really saw themselves as, as stewards and saw themselves as part of a larger web of life. And then, of course, the current dominant culture here has been very invasive, very much an invasive species, and has come in and just sort of not honored the earth, not honored other species, and come in really to liquefy, commodify, and profit off of the, the landscape and the, and the species here. So of course we would, we would tend to arrive at this notion eventually that we should protect nature from ourselves. But um, there is a more ancient way, which is also a more modern way. And I think this bench, which is sitting in kind of the, the midst of this lovely food forest demonstration project that we've been creating, um, sort of says it all. There is a place for us. Um, in the environments yeah. of, of yeah. biodiversity that can nurture not only um, a wider spectrum of life, but that we can also find um, a way to be here as well in a way that's complementary, like a gardener in a way, yeah. but not yeah. an arrogant gardener, one that is constantly observing and is, is humble and seeking to engender more fruitfulness for all, all families concerned. I feel like uh your symbol of the bench, right, is this lovely invitation to to view a bit of the wild here. I mean, this is not this is not a manicured lawn. This is this is or, or, or even a manicured ornamentalist. This is growing like we all must remember back there from our ancient our ancient ancestral history of of remembering what it was like to live in the wild and eat from the wild mm -hmm. and be friends with everybody else that lived in the wild or be at least part of the same community. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about um, our, in, the, in City Repair we have a mentor named Judy Bluehorse, and she's a, a Native American elder in this community and also a very dynamic teacher in universities and also in permaculture settings. And uh, she's been helping people to be aware that our notion that things are wild is very, quite different actually from the native sense of their relationship to nature, which was really that, you know, there, there was a native ecology, but at the same time, human beings were here participating in it in a way that was, uh, involved a real management regime. 
uh -huh, where, for instance, uh -huh, uh -huh. fields would actually be burned in order to um, affect the fertility of the soil mm. and mm. also to ensure that there were clearings that would attract deer yeah. and then they would hunt deer in those places. Mm -hmm. So they actually were um, affecting their environment in a way that would, was beneficial really for themselves and, and all species. And I think that's really brought home by the fact that, that uh, the people of this place saw themselves in relationship, in a familial relationship with the dominant species, mm -hmm. well, with all of the species of this place. Mm -hmm. And it's such a revelation to learn that, but then also to learn that ancestral peoples of the colonizing population here also were like that before we ourselves were conquered. Uh -huh. I mean, for instance, Celtic cosmology, Celtic architecture was interrelated in a, an extremely similar way as the native perspective here where you would see that all things were cyclical. Yes, yes. And so a lot of rituals and even, you know, habitation structures would be made in a circular way. Not so much circular in this region because the longhouse was created largely as an expression of the kind of material they were working with, which were logs and planks made out of the uh, locally available cedars and things. But more in the plains, you know, circular teepees configured in circles would be expressing their sense of the circularity. The, the native people in our area, the Mayadu, made circular homes We're using the cedar planks, but in a, in a circular roundhouse, partly dug into the girth. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they were touched with that. Beautiful. Well, I would love a little tour. Yeah. Well, first I want to start off by crediting Marisha Arbach, who ah. has been our um, most experienced food forest designer and consultant in this project. Now, I'm a teacher of permaculture myself, but my strength is in kind of human spaces and more human systems and then urban scale systems. And so I'm also a student of, of mm. you know, food forest design, but I can tell you a lot about what we've done. Uh, one of the really interesting aspects here is that we are training vines up onto these lovely trellises Show in me. order to shade the glass. This trellis here, has these uh, incredibly lovely succulent grapes up on the structure. And as you can see with the sunlight kind of coming down onto the building, yeah. it actually casts shadows onto the glass. So rather than heating up as we would in a greenhouse because of the sun just pouring down on us through the warm months, instead we actually have um, shade being cast upon the building by the food that we're growing. Now this is certainly a, a great example of permaculture because in permaculture we want to be getting multiple functions out of anything that we do mm -hmm. because we're always trying to create relationships between things. So we're creating a relationship between the interior space and the exterior space here by growing edible vines up onto the exterior in order to keep the interior shaded from the sun and keep it cool in the warm months. So. The, the upshot of that is, first of all, it's a lovely, elegant solution. But secondly, we don't need to use an air conditioner in this environment because oh, of course. all that we do is flush nighttime air into the space at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the uh, thermal mass of everything in the interior, from books to the floor slab to the furniture, even to the air, then is made to be colder. And we just seal up the building during the day. And it's like being in a refrigerator during the hottest days of Fabulous. the year. So, natural air conditioning yeah. from the shading and, and the thermal mass. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, it's a wonderful balance. And what kind of vines are you growing up there? Well, this is a white grape and it's seedless. So, fortunately, it's very abundant. Otherwise, we wouldn't even get much ourselves because we're living <laughs> in an urban environment where people will walk by and, like for instance, right here, Sure. The, these grapes will not last long once they once they mature. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They'll want to become raisins, of course, but they won't have half a chance. <laughs> because all the passers-by on oh. the sidewalk will nibble, nibble. This place is famous. People love coming by here so much because really almost any time of year you can get something. Really, actually any time of year. There's, there's herbs. For instance, here we have rosemary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Wonderful. people in the neighborhood, if they're baking a, you know, a bread, or uh, baking a chicken or something can come by and just pluck a sprig oh, a rosemary mm -hmm. really any time of year that they need it because this is always here and uh, 
if they want to and they they need to get some roses they can come by and pick some oh. of course you know we want to we want to use this ourselves but there's more than enough for people to share even though we're surrounded by apartment buildings which is of course one of the principles in permaculture right yeah. share the surplus yeah and and here you are yeah and i think we have a bit of surplus rosemary here so i <laughs> I want to make sure our neighbors know that they can come by and get any of this that they need. It would be fine if they would cut away a lot of it if they wanted. That's a bit of placemaking, isn't it, too? Inviting people yeah. into, into your place. Yep. Now, who's here? You've well, got a, a bunch of these, huh? We have a, we have a little uh, blackberry coming in here, which, will, of course, will always happen. <laughs> blackberry loves to party with other plants, so somehow or other it's, it's found its way into the rosemary bush, so we're just going to clear it out a little bit. But, you know, just coming out and doing occasional maintenance is a good thing. You know, you, people want to get up during the day and stretch and walk outside so they can get some air and uh, just to get out of the office for a minute and stand out in the sun. So this is a nice way to just kind of come out and get a little exercise while you maintain the landscape. This is, um, you know, this is as much about beating back the blackberries as it is about keeping the landscape beautiful because in this setting in the city of course this is a demonstration project and so we are experiencing the direct benefit of having an edible landscape that is beautiful and keeps our utilities bills down and keeps our carbon footprint um, very small and makes um, all of these benefits. That's all great, but at the same time, it's beautiful. Yes. And I yes, think that's the. Yes. And we hunger for beauty. Yeah, we, we do. We're raised in beauty. It's. Uh, Speaking of beauty. It's absolutely essential that we make it beautiful, well maintained, and attractive because then we're convincing. You seem to have done a, a nice variety of flowering plants. And as you were saying, plants that, oh, look at this. Oh, they're gorgeous. These roses were just crowding the sidewalk, so it was a good excuse to, to kind of clear the sidewalk a little bit while we get some flowers for the inside of the, of the office. So I want to, starting back up here, you've got trees. I mean, you, there are layers in this, as you do with any, any food forest. So yeah. tell us about layers. but. I, this is what I, I want to start with the top and yeah. work our way down. Well, okay, one of the things, uh, food forest is one term. Um, it's kind of synonymous with another term, which is vertical gardening. Huh. Huh. So a food forest, some say that you can have as many as nine layers within a food forest. Others say the, the most is seven. This is a six, six layered food forest. Okay. So we have six, um, six strata from the ground plane to the top of the primary trees. And um, this would be our primary tree here, the tallest one, this Asian pear, is the tallest tree of the site. That one, or this, is that this one? That's this, this one. one. Okay, all right. And uh, you can see that it's, it's the most southern, so it's casting a lot of shade on plants that are just to the north of it. Um, but that's okay, because there's plenty of sun coming in. The next layer down is this dwarf fruit tree. So within the strata of the food forest, there are taller trees, and then there are less taller trees. In this case, this is kind of a dwarf plum. Okay. I think it's an Italian plum, actually, yep. or prune. They don't get a chance to become prunes around here, though. Frankly, they just get eaten as <laughs> plums. <laughs> they want to be prunes. But um, so that's the, that's, so layer, the highest layer is this Asian pear. This, is the next highest layer. This, the, not just this plum, but we have a peach here, an almond, uh, apple, cherry, and uh, uh, another plum tree. And I, if I get my way, we'll have an apricot. I can't believe you have that many trees in such a small space. It's pretty this amazing. Is not, this is not, how many square feet? You have, what, two, two or three feet of, a, of, a, of the boulevard. We've got three feet here and two feet, a little over two feet over here. Two feet here, I mean. All told, now all around the office, it's about, it's about 100 linear feet wrapping around the building, okay. uh, maybe 120, but um, the overall amount of uh, arable space we have is only about 300 square feet, but it's all in edges. 
So its effect is really tremendous. It lines both sides of 100 feet, 100-ish feet of the pathway, and it completely surrounds this kind of this segment of the block. Right. So its effect is tremendous. Yeah, I mean it's a big multiplier. It's not. I mean, if all one had was just one face, you do what you can on it in the face. But you have both the south and the what east-facing mm -hmm. sides. So it sounds like you've, she's you have done planting. You know, optimized for both the shade yeah. and the sun, the hot sun. So are these plants sun-loving plants? Yeah, on the south side they're sun-loving. And on the east face we get enough light over there to have plenty of sun-loving plants over there as well. But it's a little bit darker, so we planned for plants that were a little bit more shade-oriented mm -hmm, mm -hmm, than on mm -hmm, this side. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, here you have sun chokes coming in. And these are wonderful these? tubers. Yeah. Sun chokes. Sun chokes. They're Jerusalem artichoke? Is that, yeah, the, is that what exactly. they're yes. All right. And they absolutely, you know, soak in sun. So they're just there and uh, you almost can't tell them to leave even if you didn't want them around. <laughs> There's, they're, they're, but they're wonderful and they're great with a lot of foods. And your irises were here earlier in yeah. the season. So yeah. you have flowers that come at different times. So there's always a, almost always yeah. something flowering. Well, that's, that's, that's part of what's going on with uh, any sort of garden design. But in the case of an edible garden, you want to be figuring out um, how to phase so that the, there's, there's flowering continuously through the season, so you're supporting pollinators, but you're also just able to be surrounded by beauty constantly. Yes, yes. And then edibility, you want to be able to plant things so that there's always something to eat. You know, What, what we're also in is, a, is, is classically called a, a snack track. Because we're right on a pathway. I've never heard that word. Yes. <laughs> Snack track. Yeah, it's one of the more favorite uh, concepts in permaculture to like actually that. just be able to eat as you're out walking. I have this great picture. It's like nibble a berry here and nibble a berry here and dig up some rosemary here yeah. and smell, yeah. the, smell the lavender when it's ready. I love it. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Just to be able to kind of graze as you go. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lovely idea. Um, now that vine, that's... That's another one of the intermediary layers between the bottom and the top, is the right. vine that kind of goes through everything. So you could call that layer number four here. And then number three would be the sort of shrub layer. Like this? Is this a shrub kind uh -huh. of layer? Yeah. And then number two would be these lower growing plants. Mm -hmm. And then number one would be the ground cover here. Now, for, for in, the, in the controversy about whether or not you can have seven or more or nine, it depends on what all you're doing. Like the seventh layer is the tuber layer, where you actually would oh. get down in. I guess we do have a we se have seven layer. Tubers, right? Yeah, Aren't because we got some tubers here. Yeah. So that's the underground layer. Yeah, so okay. there's an underground layer. But then when you start to get into even more layers, that has to do with whether or not you have aquatic environments. Oh my so you can actually, you can, you can go to more than seven if you have um, water or. Uh, a wetland mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, pond or something mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. around where you are. And then in an urban environment like this, you know, you'll have things like these planters, which adds another yeah, element. I was, who are you, what's the... These what? are blueberries. Oh, and they're looking yeah. very I happy see, this boy, year. They, you're going to have a lot. This is it the best like. they've ever looked, so I think we're going to have a great crop this year. It's a great way to welcome people to the I, office, really, these barrels right really. at the I can entry. imagine. I can imagine walking in and saying, Nibble, 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 nibble. They're <laughs> coming in with yeah. blue, fing you know, blue fingers. And, and, and you know, we, we're not too crass about it, but you could say it's a marketing strategy. Like, oh, everyone will think, well, if I work with Communitexture, we can have blueberries. <laughs> but that's not really what's going on. We just want everyone to have blueberries. You know, Is one thing that's really interesting, now that we actually, now that at our office we have an edible urban agriculture demonstration project, we are actually attracting more clients who want to integrate the architecture that they want to live in or work in with edible landscapes. Nice. It's a really fascinating, you know, we're not interviewing and asking people about, about but, that, but, but you it's know, happening. What, what what's, and this is part of why we wanted to do the show, Mark, is that if you see it, if you see it's working and it's beautiful and it smells, all of that, it becomes, it's real. Yeah. And you have so softened this, this building and this corner, you know, which urban, urban environments are so linear and so gray and, and so on. It's like you've so softened this and brought life to it yeah. that I can, that I, that it's like, it's inviting. 
I mean, I would imagine that the, the folks walking by feel like, oh, like, like here, when I was coming down here and looking at this, this area, it's like the arbor, the arching of the, the trees over along with your trellis. It's like, it's like, oh, this feels like a haven. It is a haven. I want to add another uh, layer of consideration here. It's a haven as a microclimate. We are, notice that we're in shade right now. The, the sun is coming down and washing over the landscape, but we're actually standing in the shade of our food forest. And part of what we're doing here is we're aware of the fact that there is an, an urban heat island effect where the urban environment can be as much as 15 or 20 degrees hotter than the surrounding landscape, unnecessarily, simply because the sun is coming down. The sun is coming down and where it used to hit the earth and become life that respirates mm -hmm, and basically mm -hmm. cools, modulates. It cools the temperature a bit, or yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it becomes um, a complement to the overall climate of the region. Instead, in urban environments, it hits asphalt or concrete and it simply becomes heat. It gets stored as heat and then it radiates heat and then it actually contributes not only to our misery, in which people actually can die from yes, just being yes, overheated, yes. but it actually contributes to um, an increased evaporation effect where the soil loses its, its moisture because the environment is so hot that, that moisture is leaving the, the, the very ground around us because of the conditions. So in a sense, it's part of the greenhouse warming effect. It is an identified major contributor to climate change. I mean, we're, we're sitting there every day with our cities just sitting there being columns of heat rising out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Like, this light should become life. It shouldn't just become heat. Yes. That's... And so it is here. I mean, and that's why, you know, that's why trees planted wherever they can be or, or, yeah. or so on. But, but even more abundantly, I mean, lawns do some of that, but nothing like, nothing yeah. like this with the diversity. Yeah. Um, did your... Hello, Hello there. there. Me. Come on through. Thanks a lot. Enjoy. Um, well, you know, as usual in our work, we are very conscious of the fact that we're confronting um, physical and mental constructs that have to do with colonialism. So you notice that we're standing in a very linear pathway. Yes. The yes. sidewalk is carved up into squares. We're within a square block that is within an overall grid. By planting a forest and, and being so thoughtful, we are actually confronting, creatively confronting, this mentality of, of really thoughtlessness that you can just come in and lay a, a geometry over the world irrespective of the nature of the ecology or of the way that water prefers to flow, irrespective of all of the stories and the nature of the relationships that want to persist here, that suddenly we will carve up the world to be for sale and just liquidate everything constantly yeah. uh, and leave no legacy of thought, of thought or creativity, <coughs> but only of work and construction and destruction at the same time. So we're actually just sitting here being villagers again, saying, well, we're going to cultivate fertility pretty much once again, in spite of whatever sort of construct we're in. And once again, engender mutual benefit, try to stir up our our community to um, wake up to that opportunity mm -hmm. because everything becomes easier when we do this and more beautiful and meaningful as well. Like instead of just, well, you know what, we don't just want to demonstrate something about edible, edibility. We want people to notice that they're walking around bonking into the, into the walls of their containment all the time, asking uh. themselves, oh, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of mm -hmm. all of this? Mm -hmm. And what we're doing here is just letting the earth burst forth with self-evident meaning and wonder so that people can just stand here and be appreciative and stop asking such silly questions, you know? I mean, native cultures don't ask that question because they are, they're living the meaning, you know, of what it means to be in deep connection. You are in relationship, yeah. you know, the relationship. So you're rebuilding those relationships or at least waking up folks to, there are, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a bigger life. Yeah. Which reminds me, last two minutes, sure. walk with me down your, down your straight corridor, but all the edges are getting, getting, what do I say, softened. I want to just, we have in our last two minutes, any other thoughts? Oh, look, more roses. Oh. These are the, another kind of rose, the little roses. 
I think, um, yeah, other thoughts would be that we love, we love our people. We're not, like this is, a, this is a business, but it's a, it's a, it's not a business in the sense that you're used to thinking of commerce. Like we've created this with great intention to be of benefit to humanity. So everything that we do in this extremely cutting edge endeavor is to create models, models, models that offer alternative ideas and yes. visions. And everyone, you know what, we don't even get exploitive people coming to us anymore. People that come here to want to work with us know that we are deeply committed to mm. collaboration. Everyone that walks away from here, I think, wonders like, well, where was the ego in this one? Uh, because uh. they just kept wanting me to feel like it was my design, you know? And that's really the truth. We want people to, just like a snail creates its own shell, we want people to come in and be, have such a collaborative experience that they grow in their own literacy of design and they take design skills and tools and, and, and language with them in their lives to share with other people. So we're just sharing constantly, and I'll tell you why. We notice that that's how the universe works. Yeah. We want ourselves to be in alignment yeah. with the very economy of how the world is working around us. Like, every time you draw a breath, apparently it's free, you know? Your, your very body is a gift of the universe yes. and your mother. So we want to be acting in accord with that. This display here, <clears throat> is meant to inspire people so that as, they, as they're lingering for a while, it tells the story of what we did here and, and why we did it and what they're surrounded by. So there's this key of, uh, that's numbered and then it explains the theory and concept of the food forest and then it identifies each of the layers, tree, shrub, herbaceous, 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 ground cover, vine, and more ground cover <clears throat> that all ends up adding, adding up to this marvelous place. Of 84 plants at least listed here. 84, yeah, 84 varieties of edibles, and I'm pretty sure it's more than that I'm sure. at this point. Because you haven't listed all the roses. Yeah. For, which, no. You get rose hips yeah. at the end of the season from this. Thank you. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. Thank you. Thank you for, for not only the tour, the beautiful work, but also inspiring us with, with breaking out of the prisons of our minds to, yeah. to, to seeing to return to a way, living the way nature does. Well, thank, thank you, for, you for, for sharing the stories. That's fun. All right, Mark. Till next time. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm with Mark Lakeman. What inspiration. Put the forests where you are. Plant those foods and the flowers for everybody. Join us next time. <laughs>